Our New Testament lesson in the text for our sermon comes from the Gospel according to Mark, the 12th chapter, verses 28 through 34. Mark 12, 28 through 34. Listen to the word of God. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and beside him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. Here in the readings, let us pray. Oh God, tell us what we need to hear and show us what we ought to do to obey Jesus Christ. Amen. A D. A D? How did you get a D on your English test? You were viewing your sixth grader's test grade with disbelief. She made straight A's in elementary school, and you realized middle school would require some adjustment, but going from an A to a D was more adjustment than you had in mind. Can you explain this to me, you ask, attempting to control the tone in your voice, realizing this does not qualify as a national disaster, yet fearful this could be the beginning of a trend. Sitting at the kitchen table, you look up into her face, examining her pupils for any telltale sign of drug use, then admitting to yourself you may be overreacting just a bit. Her facial expression denotes she is not sure which tack to take. Dads are suckers for their daughter's tears, but this looks like one of those occasions when tears will not provide an escape. Quickly, she decides on the time-honored strategy of comparison. Most other kids did worse than me. You pounce. It was like throwing raw meat to the dog. Those kids aren't my daughter. If everyone jumped off the bridge, would you... This isn't about competing with others, it's about doing your best. How could you have gotten a D? Did you study? I've studied three hours. Were you on the phone during that time, taking a bath, listening to music, or really studying, concentrating? I, I was really studying. Did you understand the material? I thought I did. Did you read the chapter? Twice. Then how did you do so poorly it's the teacher's fault your daughter replies producing a look of betrayal and shock at such poor teaching techniques she put questions on the test she told, didn't tell us were going to be there she looks at you with those beautiful brown brown eyes seeking your support in this gross unfairness oh you respond softening a bit so the questions weren't from the chapter you were assigned to read. Well, no, they, they were from the chapter. Were they trick questions where she led you astray when you really knew the answers? No, they were pretty straightforward. Then what do you mean she didn't tell you what would be on the test? 
Well, she replied, looking indignant at the absent teacher, she didn't tell us these five questions would be on there. When Billy asked her what would be on the test, she mentioned those questions I got right. She didn't say a word about these. But honey, when she told you the test would be over the entire chapter, that meant all the material, not just the sample questions she mentioned. Well, your daughter defiantly and unapologetically responds, she didn't say that. Why would anyone give a test and not tell you exactly what was going to be on it? Well, in our story, a teacher of the scriptures comes to Jesus and wants to know exactly what's going to be on the test. Jesus has journeyed to Jerusalem for the last time. Suffering and death await only days away. Entering the magnificent temple complex, he is immediately accosted by the religious authorities. Preceding our passage, a number of events occur in which the authorities attempt to trap Jesus, get him to verbally break the Jewish law so they may arrest him. But they cannot contend with his wisdom or the truth of his statements. And after these attempted character assassinations, we are shocked when this scribe or biblical scholar hears Jesus' answers and agrees with him. He recognizes Jesus as a person of unusual insight and knowledge, so he asks a legitimate question, one for which he really desires an answer. Which commandment is the first of all? Now, this was not a new question. Jewish scholars had been arguing over it for centuries. Since the Jewish law contained 365 prohibitions and 248 positive commands, rabbis were constantly discussing which laws were the most important and which one was the greatest of all. Or just tell me exactly what's going to be on the test. So this scribe, Hearing the brilliance of Jesus' answers, sensing a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, edges his way through the crowd and pops the big question to Jesus. Which commandment is the first of all? And Jesus replies, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, this was a revolutionary reply. Some other rabbis had approached this concept, but no one had been able to express it so clearly, distinctly, and beautifully. The great rabbi Hillel had once been asked by a non-Jew to instruct him in the whole law while he stood on one leg. Hillel answered, What thou hatest for thyself, do not do to thy neighbor. This is the whole law, the rest is commentary. Go and learn. But Jesus combines three central elements of faith. The Shema from Deuteronomy was recited by Jews every morning and evening and began and ended the synagogue service. This prayer, quoted by Jesus, expressed the belief in one God and our wholehearted love and devotion to him. Last, emphasizing an obscure passage from Leviticus, Jesus says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. In this story, the scribe agrees with Jesus' pronouncement. And standing in the temple precincts, the paraphernalia of animal sacrifice all about him, the scribe notes how this mandate is much more important than the sacrifices that characterize temple worship. Now, the scribe was surrounded by priests who had given their lives, earned their living from this sacrificial system. You can feel the hatred from their glowering eyes. But Jesus, looking straight into the man's face, gives him a wonderful compliment. You are not far from the kingdom of God. And verse 34b says, 
After that, no one dared to ask him any question. Jesus cut off debate because there was no way to argue with his word. Martha Skelton, the attractive young widow whom Thomas Jefferson married in 1771, had many suitors before she settled on Jefferson. One day, according to a popular story, two gentlemen happened to call on her at the same time. They were friends and decided to go in together. But as they were about to pass from the hall into the drawing room, they heard some music. Someone was playing the violin accompanied by the harpsichord, and a lady and a gentleman were singing. The two gentlemen knew at once it, who it was. Jefferson was the only violinist in the neighborhood. They looked resignedly at each other. We are wasting our time, said one to the, to the other. We may as well go home. After Jesus' revolutionary perfect answer, it would have been a waste of time to argue with him. So the religious authorities just went home. The Great Commandment provides many avenues for preaching material, but Jesus' words harbor two elements which stand at his core. First, note that the operative verb in both admonitions is love. We are to love God and love one another. Now, in our society, no other concept gets more use or misuse than the word love. Today, the idea of love has become so intertwined with sex that we have almost completely lost the New Testament view of love. This is too bad because the Christian concept of love is the glue binding together the entire New Testament. Now, I would like for our young people to listen up. Because what we believe about love affects our relationships with our parents, our spouses, our friends, fellow church members, all of our contacts in life. In the Bible, love is never an emotion or feeling. Scriptural love doesn't make you warm and fuzzy inside. Love is not an emotional liking, but active goodwill. To love someone is to promote their good as actively as you do your own. In the Bible, love is not affection, but action. To love someone is to act magnanimously and compassionately toward and for them. Otherwise, love seeks the best for another person. Like God's love for us, Christian love has little to do with feelings, but makes decisions and acts in favor of others. Both times Jesus uses the word love in this commandment, it is stated in the imperative. For the Christian, there is no choice. We will love God and other human beings. Love is the basis of our relationship with God and with one another. A woman told about a friend who was a 40-year-old mother with two sons who all of a sudden discovered she was pregnant. When she asked her how she felt about this, she wailed, I have sons of 19 and 18 away at college, and I certainly don't want another baby at this stage of life. Well, you have nothing to worry about, her doctor said. You are still a good age to bear a child. Everything will go smoothly. It's not the baby's birth that's upsetting me, she said. What I simply cannot face is the thought of going through that whole routine all over again with the PTA. Love is not found in feelings, but actions. Because we love our children, we do the PTA routine, drive carpool, sacrifice for college tuition. 
because we love God, we attend worship, give our money, teach Sunday school, sing in the choir. And because we love God's people, we act and speak in ways that aid them in becoming all God wants them to be. Now, you can see how important Christian love is for our human relationships. When we define love by feeling, the volatility of our emotions makes us extremely vulnerable to falling, falling in and out of love. But true love builds its base on commitment. It works on behalf of the other person. And the same is true of God. Love of God is not an emotional or spiritual feeling. Rather, it exemplifies itself in concrete actions of commitment and service. And this carries into the second point I want to make. Notice that Jesus puts love of God and love of human beings together. You cannot have one without the other. Now, it is usually much easier to love God than people. Unless a tragedy occurs for which we want to blame God, the Almighty stands apart with his forgiveness, majesty, and omnipotence. People, on the other hand, are far less likable. Their faults and unattractive habits are readily apparent. But Jesus gives us no choice in the matter. If we truly love God, we will love others. We will seek their greatest good. We will do all we can to come to their aid. Now this ancient con struggle continues within the church and each one of us. Some of the most pious, faithful people I have known have been the most hateful, prejudiced, and destructive. With praise of the Almighty on their lips, they have demeaned and harmed other people. Jesus tells us this cannot be. Just as he loved and forgave those who attacked and crucified him, we are called to act in the best interests of those whom we find difficult to love or even like. The story is told of a castaway who is rescued from a desert island and it's discovered that t- during his 10-year solitary sojourn, He constructed two beautiful houses of worship, a Gothic structure on the east end and a modern one on the west. His rescuers are baffled. One house of worship they can understand, for through those long, lonely years, he surely had great need for spiritual sustenance. But why two houses of worship? The answer was simple. Pointing to one of the sanctuaries, the shipwrecked sailor announces, that's the church I don't attend. Jesus told us we cannot reject or categorize people. We are to love all God's children and work for the benefit of each and every human being. If we love God, we will love one another. Cutting off debate. Our passage says that after Jesus made the pronouncement about the great commandment and he told the scribe he was not far from the kingdom of God, no one dared ask him any question. Truth and power of Jesus' command to love God and one another alerted them to how deficient they were in their own spiritual lives. And the commandment presents the same challenge to us today is our relationship with God and one another based on the New Testament concept of love or have we allowed the world's idea of feelings and emotions to dominate our relationships this morning let us resolve to love God and one another like Jesus 
May you and I illustrate that love in all we do and say, both inside this sanctuary and outside those doors.